I'll go over a old PowerPoint that I gave a long time ago as a seminar at Hope and before that at the Calvin College Engineering Department, having to do with the noise in a radio frequency receiver. So it's noise at high frequencies, but frequency is important for noise because noise occurs over a frequency range. There are always AC signals, and it really has to do with signals. So we'll deal with radio, actually. So 100 megahertz and above is kind of where this is happening with radio frequency signals. A radio frequency signal isn't just a sine wave, but if you look at a sine wave on, say, a oscilloscope, you might see something like this, a nice, clearly defined period, one over the frequency. But a signal is going to be more complex. It's going to contain components, and those components won't all have the same frequency. They might, they might have different phase, phase shift keying, but they most likely have different frequencies. And each one of those components carries information and is important. You actually want to know how they're doing. And so you might look at a radio frequency with a spectrum analyzer. And here's just some made up spectrum of a signal that has components at you know, these three frequencies, 62, 75, 97 megahertz, different power levels, and, and maybe make a graph of the power level versus frequency. And first thing I'd point out is the power level is always plotted logarithmically because it covers several orders of magnitude. That's the function of a spectrum analyzer pictured here on the screen. You'll see the frequency axis is horizontal and the power axis or the voltage squared axis is vertical. Let's take a look at that instrument's display and how noise is visible in it. This is a real radio signal right off of a cell phone tower. I took this back in, oh, probably 1999, looking at the cellular uh, I think this is the downlink B-band signals bleeding off of a receiver antenna. First thing I point out is there's a lot of signal in here. All of this is desirable. All of this you want to go to the receiver and you want to demodulate. But there's also a lot of noise over here. Now this noise is not necessarily coming down the antenna. It might be after the receiver. That's where the spectrum was taken after the receiver front end. And this is all noise out here because there's clearly no signal. It's at some, some level that uh, the instrument is capable of giving. Just to get a little definition here, there's the noise power, which is how much power is contained in here. But if you looked at the noise over infinite frequency, you would conclude there's infinite noise power. But we're never interested in infinite frequency, and no instrument can actually manage that, and so it's not actually going to happen. But we're concerned with the power contained in a certain bandwidth. So here's a bandwidth, and we're interested in the noise power. If you integrated this whole noise over this bandwidth, you would get that. And so noise comes in units of power per hertz, or volts per root hertz. So we're concerned with noise power contained within a single hertz. That's the power spectral density. The origin of noise has to do with the conduction electrons. So ideally, charge carriers are flowing through a conductor. It's in a straight line, all going in the same direction, all going at the same speed, the drift velocity, all a result of an applied voltage. Here we have the applied voltage across this conductor. And that's purely deterministic motion. Unfortunately, that's not what happens because there's temperature. And so superimposed on top of that drift velocity is the random thermal motion of the charge carriers, completely random in direction, random in speed around a, an average that has to do with the temperature. So there's a distribution of the speeds but the direction is completely arbitrary and it's going in all directions. So you superimpose the drift velocity, which is all in one direction, and the thermal velocity, and your charge carriers still go. You still get to transmit your signal from one end of the conductor to the other, but it's going to arrive with some noise on it. And that's what we're going to look at. I still haven't made it clear how that random motion of charge carriers translates into that noise floor on the spectrum analyzer that you just can't get below. So we're going to have to look into that. There's this thermal motion where the charge carriers have a certain amount of kinetic energy, which is related to temperature. Average kinetic energy of carriers is 3 halves 
Boltzmann's constant times temperature. So this is statistical mechanics there. You know, that's your one half mv squared for all the carriers. On average, there is a distribution around the mean given by the Boltzmann distribution. And you have the net forward direction. So you have these two motions, the, the, the thermal motion, which is the second bullet point, and the drift motion, which is this first bullet point, superposed on top of each other. Now turn off that voltage. So now let's not apply voltage. So all you have is the thermal motion. Does that mean voltage goes away? So let's think about what might happen. Now you have a bunch of charge carriers that are bouncing around this electrical conductor. They're not being pushed by an external voltage from one end to the other. They're just bouncing around. This is where I'm going to make what I call the reciprocity argument. It's just my made up word for it. If voltage causes carrier motion, then carrier motion causes voltage. So even though no voltage is being applied to this conductor, the carriers are moving around. And as a carrier moves around, it generates a voltage. And so every carrier is making a little bit of voltage because it's moving. Now you'd say, well, all those voltages will cancel because the direction is random, right? So for every carrier moving to the left, there's one moving to the right. It's going to cancel. Except it's not the voltage that we measure. We measure voltage squared. We measure the, the power. So, so each carrier moves, it makes a voltage, and then there's dissipation, V squared divided by resistance. We measure the power due to the motion of those carriers. That doesn't cancel. And that's the noise power. That's what we're going to be seeing in our instrument when we get this flat floor and the signal can't be seen if it's below that flat floor. So let's model it. We can come up with an expression that relates useful quantities like temperature to the noise that we see. And so in 1928, Nyquist published a model of electronic noise based on a transmission line. So he said, imagine a transmission line. The transmission line is length L over 2. Inside the transmission line, you have electrons that can flow back and forth. Forget about applying voltage. There's just charge carriers in there. Those charge carriers can move around. And as they move around, they excite modes in that transmission line of length L over 2. You have boundary conditions at the end. It's a vibrating string. And there are only certain frequency modes, and hence wavelength modes, that can be excited. Like the lowest order mode is twice the length of the transmission line because you have one half a sine wave. The next one is exactly the length of the transmission line. The next one is two-thirds the length, all the way up to n equals a million. I mean, it just goes up and up in principle to infinity. And you, you have an infinite number of modes you could be exciting, and you can have an infinite amount of noise power if you had the ability to look over infinite frequency, which you don't. There's a relationship then between this n, which characterizes how many half sine waves are contained in the mode. So like this purple one is n equals 3, you have 3 half sine waves. The length of the transmission line, L over 2 being the length. And the wavelength, then you quickly realize, is just this L divided by n. The first order mode, the wavelength is twice the length. The wavelength is L when n is 1. The wavelength is L over 2 and N is 2, yeah, it works out. So this expression relates the wavelength of each mode to the length of the transmission line. That can be very quickly turned into the noise energy that's in here. All we're doing is making the assumption that electrons can bounce back and forth and generate electromagnetic energy, which has a wavelength which couples into the whatever mode is equal to that wavelength. And so let's see how much energy there actually is. So it would be the number of modes that are in here times the energy in each mode. And so how many modes are in here? Well, an infinite number, so we have to be a little more restrictive. Let's say the number of modes per width of frequency. I don't want to say per hertz. I could. But I'll just say per some frequency. The number of modes per some range of frequencies times that range of frequency is the number of modes that we're going to consider being excited. Take that number of modes and multiply it by the energy contained in each mode, and you have noise energy. Because all measurements are confined to some frequency range, so you may as well do it that way. The expression for energy per mode is very simple. It just comes from Planck's black body radiation. The energy per mode, you ready for this? It's 
Boltzmann's constant times temperature. The number of modes per unit frequency we're going to come up with right now just by looking at the wave number for a mode. We can replace energy per mode with Planck's energy per mode, the KT, get Boltzmann's constant times temperature. But the number of modes per unit frequency takes a little more thought. Let's just give it that thought. Let's start with wave number, 2 pi over the wavelength, and replace wavelength with L over N, our expression. The definition of wave number is omega over speed. And just put these two expressions together, sort it out for N. So when you equate these two little expressions, you have this thing. N is you know, 2 pi F over V, L over 2 pi, fine. You can cancel the 2 pi's, I didn't. And they have an expression for the number of modes per speed. But what we can do is differentiate it to find the number of modes per unit frequency. Because you have frequency upstairs. So dn by df gives you the number of modes per frequency. And when you go dn by df, you're left with L over V. And that's your number of modes per frequency. So put that in. Put L over V in for this. So you have noise energy is L over V times kT times delta F. So L over V times KT times delta F is the noise energy contained within a frequency range delta F. So you just pick a frequency range delta F. And that's the noise energy in it. Now there's a power that we can talk about. You have to go back to look at your transmission line. The transmission line always has two ends to it. Input end and an output end. There are always two ports. There are always two ends to any line that the signal is going to pass through. If we stand at one of those ends and look at the energy coming out of it per unit time, that's what you call the power. The energy coming out of it is what we just derived an expression for, but you better divide it by two because there are two ends and we're only sitting at one end, so we'll take half of that energy. And the time is the time it takes the signal to move from one end to the other end. So you use the length of the line divided by the speed. The length is L over 2. The speed we'll call V. V, that's the wave speed. And that's convenient because now we have an expression for noise power. You take our expression for energy divided by 2 and divided by L over 2 V. And so velocity cancels out, which is convenient. I was troubled by this velocity being here because I don't know what it is. But it cancels. And you're left with power is, and this is a famous equation. People call this KTB noise or thermal noise, K, Boltzmann's constant temperature, B for bandwidth, colloquially referred to as KTB noise. Power is just those three things. That's the noise power. It's linear in temperature. It's also linear in bandwidth. If you double the frequency range over which you measure it, you'll also get twice as much power. But this is what we're going to take advantage of right now. If you change the temperature, you change the power. If you double the temperature, you'll double the power. Now we need to quantify that power, though, in terms of measurable things. Let's go back to our spectrum analyzer. We have all of our signals, and we have our noise floor. Now these signal levels are logarithmic, so it's log of power on the vertical axis. Ten times log of power is actually decibels, and that's what we use, decibels. But that's the signal level. Down here we have noise. The difference is the signal to noise. That's the difference. So if you take how high the signal is in decibels and subtract where the noise floor is in decibels, you have the signal to noise. Here we have a signal with very little signal to noise. And here we have a signal with a lot of signal to noise. And that's the signal to noise ratio. So signal to noise ratio in decibels is easy. It's just the difference between the signal height and the floor height. If you were to do the signal-to-noise ratio for not having logarithms, you would take the quotient of these two levels if it wasn't logarithmic on the horizontal axis, hence the word ratio. The noise factor is an indication of how much noise a particular component contributes to the signal. A certain amount of noise goes into any component, and a certain amount of noise comes out of it. And the ratio of the signal-to-noise ratio going in to signal-to-noise ratio coming out is the noise factor. A large signal-to-noise ratio is a good thing. That's a robust signal. A small signal-to-noise ratio, less robust. And you always have a larger signal-to-noise ratio at the input than you have at the output. So the noise factor is a number greater than 1. 
A large noise factor means a lot of degradation of the signal quality. I guess this is a nice depiction of it. So you have signal and noise going into a device and you have signal and more noise coming out of a device. H is the transfer function. So that signal plus that input noise is operated on by the transfer function. But then you have more noise, plus more noise. Depict that with a noise generator right after the ideal device. So you have ideal device plus noise generator. That makes the more noise that is added. Question, what if F equals 1? If this ratio is 1, that is the noise factor is 1, that means the signal to noise ratio going in equals the signal to noise ratio coming out. And then more noise is 0. The device doesn't add any noise if it has a noise factor of 1. Okay, we'll apply it to circuits then. Here's a uh, subsystem. It's actually a subsystem, not a circuit. I have this receiver front end. It has a filter, it has a preamplifier, a mixer, an attenuator. The filter is you know, a frequency filter, it's a bandpass filter. That's what these slashes mean. A bandpass filter symbol is three sine waves on top of each other, and the slashes tell you what type of filter it is. A slash on the first and last of the three tells you it's a bandpass filter. If the slash were on the first two, that would tell you it's a high pass filter. So you see the idea? You have this filter, a gain of 0.9 means that it's attenuating because what comes out is 90% of what went in. So it has a noise factor of 1.11. So these are givens. This preamplifier has a gain of 100. So what comes out is 100, factor 100 bigger. That's 20 decibels of gain, of power gain. Noise factor is 1.6, and these are just specifications. I, don't ask me how I found them out. I made them up. The mixer has a low gain, right? It's a passive mixer, and it's a semiconducting device where you have a signal going at one frequency, and it generates signals at multiple different frequencies. It takes the one that you want out, but only 16% of the power coming in gets converted to the desired output frequency. So we have a 0.16 gain. We lose about 84% of our power in this mixer. So it has a high noise factor, a noise of fa factor of 6.3. That is, the signal to noise ratio is definitely worse on the output than on the input. And the same for the attenuator, which has a gain of 0.31. That is, you're losing 69% of your power through it. And you have a high noise factor there, too. And we can compound all these with the freeze equation. The noise factor of this whole combined system is the noise factor of the first item plus the noise factor of the second item minus one divided by the gain of the first item plus the noise factor of the third item minus one divided by the collective products of the gains of these two items and so on down the line. If I wanted the gain, for example, of this whole circuit, I would multiply these G's together. That's how you get net gain. So this filter gives you 0.9 out and the preamplifier gives you uh, factor 100 out, and you know, so you multiply all these numbers together for the total gain. So your denominator in this equation is the gain for all of the preceding components combined. And that's how that e equation works. If I have more components, I can add more terms. That's the freeze equation. So we're going to use it to justify taking uh, noise out of a signal by reducing the temperature of its components. Using our expression, we derived that the noise power is KTB, KT bandwidth. K times Boltzmann's constant temperature, and the delta F is the bandwidth over which we measure. And we want to reduce that by reducing the temperature. You can also reduce it by reducing the bandwidth, but that's not very practical because you actually you, you want a certain bandwidth. That's the whole point, but you don't want so much noise. So we're going to take it out with temperature. First, let's look at this filter. Passive device, right? It, there's no biasing done to it. It's just uh, signal in, gets attenuated signal out. A passive device has a noise figure that actually equals the gain. Here's a graph of the noise factor versus temperature for a device that has one decibel of attenuation. And then there's the amplifier. It's a low noise amplifier in a receiver front end, but not low enough. So we go on to cool it down and make it even lower. But this is what the noise factor of an amplifier looks like versus temperature. It'll be linear, fairly linear in temperature. This is a real measurement I did in my lab. I just took an amplifier, put it in a cryostat, cooled it down, and measured it over temperature. 
So it's going to get smaller and smaller. But noise factor is always greater than 1. And so when you get down to 1.05, you have a very quiet device. <laughs> Here's a picture up front of this portion, the filter plus the amplifier. This chip contains the filter. You can see that these elements are individual circuit elements. They, they resonate and they're patterned right onto the chip. The amplifier is hard substrate PC board with components that are soldered and then wire bonded. In fact, you can recognize a few things. I want to bring your attention to this thing. Look at that. See, that's an inductor. It's printed. The whole uh, Lumina substrate is gold plated and then the gold is photolithographically removed in selective places, leaving this spiral, which serves as an inductor in the matching circuit. We won't talk about the mixer or what's after it because we're not going to cool those down. We're just going to chill down the filter and the low noise amplifier. This was my very first research student at Hope College. He's presumably installing some parts and here's actually the package over here. Some of you might recognize this power amplifier. Still has those pieces of gray tape on it. We're going to put this into a receiver front end. I went to a base station in Carpenterville, Illinois. And we installed this into the front end on one channel of the base station. The signal comes off the antenna, goes down into the hut, the little building that the base of the cellular antenna. Inside there is a rack of equipment, and we opened up the rack of equipment, pulled out what was there for the pre-selector filter, and we put in this. Didn't touch the mixer or the stuff that's after it. This is a picture of what the thing looks like. It could go on a tower, in which case it's in front of the antenna cable, which is even better for noise reduction. Uh, but there's a crowd cooler. It makes it really cold. This is a crowd stat, this big steel can. And inside is vacuum, and all the electronics is inside of it. And there's a, you know, externally electronics for routing the RF signal into various places because we had up to six channels in one, one can. Operated at 75 Kelvin. So we installed it at the cell station, at the base station, and we took a drive around with a test kit measuring the bit error rate in the TDMA signal. This was time division multiple axis. So this was basically before everybody went to CDMA. And so we were measuring the bit error rate. Red is good. The opposite here. Red is good. Blue is not so good. Green is bad. <laughs> so you're driving around. We have low bit error rate. Gets a little higher. I remember the drive, so I remember we went this way, and we went this way, and I remember that right here we went into the woods. We're driving through the woods, lots of trees everywhere, and we lose signal. And the call drops. And we get this far, then we turn onto a main road and start going again, and we pick up the call again, and we go around and around and around, and we stop in Carpenterville. This is the baseline measurement. This is without the cold stuff. So this is what normally happens. So customers were probably getting mad at them right about here as they're driving, making a phone call. We needed to help them fix that. So then we installed the cold electronics and did this again. And we went driving. Look at the bit error right now. Zero to two percent all the way down to this intersection here and stays low, stays low, stays low. We get into the woods and it stays reasonable. Under eight percent, we don't drop the call. More than 8%, you're, you're at risk of dropping your call. We go all the way around. So we got all the way through this drive without dropping the call. Not only not dropping the call, but having a much better bit error rate. Basically, the sensitivity is better. The electronics at the base of the tower had lower noise figure. I mean, there's a little expression here for the sensitivity of a receiver front end based on the temperature of the electronics, T sub zero. We can't do anything about the antenna temperature, but T sub zero. We got rid of that, and we were able to get a much better sensitivity. Making it cold, we were able to reduce the electronic noise, which you have to do because the electronic noise hurts the sensitivity of your radio receiver. It proved to work out. We sold hundreds of these things and had them installed in base stations throughout the United States and a few of them in Asia, a few of them in Canada. Even though it says there are 34 slides, there are not. You should you know, read the handout on noise figure, where we look at the decibel treatment of noise factor and apply the freeze equation to different example situations. So read up on that as well.